All right, hey guys, this is now the start of unit three. Woo -woo. Unit three, we're gonna be talking about uh, the founding of the United States of America. Now I know you're like, what have we been talking about, Miss, all this time? What have you been talking about, Miss? Um, well, remember we've discussed where America's come from and colonialization. We've talked about the early uh, colonial settlers and the cultures that they built the social apparatuses in place, uh, religious, you know, things like the, the Great Awakening. And we talked about uh, the lead up to and the American Revolution where we broke away and gained our independence. But we're not actually the United States yet. This unit will cement us as the country we become, the United States of America. And that means building a constitution. A constitution is a framework for a government, usually written down on a document, a piece of paper. And while this was not like a brand new concept, the constitution that will be built at the convention in 1787 and ratified uh, finally by the early 1790s, George Washington will become president in 1789, it was revolutionary. It was the first major country in the world to ever be governed by a document like this. It's a bold experiment and that's why uh, you'll you'll hear people all the time say America still is a great experiment. We're always trying to perfect this union of ours. So anyway, um, that's mainly what we're going to be talking about, the beginning of our country um, now that we've gained our independence. And uh, this unit will go up through the War of 1812, which some people call the Empire Strikes Back, because that's when... Uh, that's when Britain's gonna try to get us back, basically, and they are the empire. Also Star Wars puns, I love Star Wars puns. Okay, um, by the way, this picture here is amazing and I love it. It says the Constitutional Convention, a famous portrait. There were 55 delegates um, that actually attended uh, the Constitutional Convention. Many more were totally absent, like they, they missed school, they were tardy, they were totally skipping absent. Uh, but of the 55 that attended, uh, there were actually, uh, I think only like 39 or something that signed the constitution. Um, and uh, those in attendance even, there were three that refused, that were even there that refused to sign it. But you can see the notables that are there at the constitutional convention it takes place uh, again in Independence Hall, just the same place where the Declaration of Independence uh, was hammered out um, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Notably, uh, there's George Washington, the president of the convention, old Ben Franklin, Gowdy in, in his 80s, uh, and then you have Alexander Hamilton there, and uh, don't forget James Madison. Little short guy, gonna be very, very important. All right, let's just begin. So remember, in 1776, when America broke away from Britain with our Declaration of Independence, uh, we needed to have some kind of government going on because uh, otherwise chaos, right? Why do we have governments? Because people are not saints. If, if people were saints, no governments would exist is a famous quote. Um, we have to have rules and laws and order uh, to organize society. That's, that's what a government does. So um, there had to be some basic framework and what the founding fathers in the Second Continental Congress there in 1776 put together and will um, put forth for ratification to the state governments because remember the Constitutional, uh, or sorry, the, the Continental Congress did not have a lot of real authority. Uh, but what they're gonna put together there in 1776 is the Articles of Confederation. Um, no, known actually formally as the Articles of Perpetual Friendship, uh, the League of Perpetual Friendship and Confederation. It's, it's the Articles of Confederation. Um, and you might have heard of that word before, confederation, like as in confederacy. That is a, a type of government framework where um, the member states are almost independent of one another as nation states, loosely bound together in this league or confederacy. Um, it's very much, uh, if you want a modern example, uh, not a great modern example considering Brexit, um, you look to the European Union, the EU. Uh, that's where you have different European nations today, not counting Britain, who's in the process of leaving the European Union, but you have France and Germany, uh, Italy, 
uh, Portugal, Spain, these various uh, European nations are part of the European Union. That is a confederacy framework where they're still independent nations, but they work together for trade, usually trade and economic barriers. They want to eliminate those um, to make trade easier. Um, a lot of economic ties. Um, and so that's what uh, the Articles of Confederation basically were. Each of the 13 states kind of would function independently and still get to govern themselves, but they were loosely bound together. And the reason that the founding fathers put together this first form of government in this confederation style was because they desperately, desperately feared going to any sort of strong central government like the one we had just left with Britain, right? They do not want a strong central government because under the English framework, you had a king, a reigning monarch with tons of authority and parliament with all this authority to tax without representation and to do all these unfair things like in our courts and laws and so on. And so they were very, very cognizant. They were very aware uh, of avoiding having that strong central authority. So they made the Articles of Confederation an extremely weak, I'll repeat that, an extremely weak central governing authority. Um, it's going to have, uh, remember we talked about the Enlightenment and um, one of the ideas that came out of the Enlightenment from like Montesquieu was separation of powers. Well, there will not really be a separation of powers because there's really no power given to the central authority in the Articles of Confederation. Um, there is just the legislative body. It had a lawmaking body, kind of like the Continental Congress, only now more official. Um, and the lawmaking body, the Congress uh, under the Articles of Confederation would have each state send one uh, representative. So every state got basically one vote. Um, and in order to pass a law under the Articles of Confederation, this Congress that has, you know, 13 votes, one from each state, would need uh, a consensus of nine. Nine of the 13 would have to vote uh, the same way to get a law passed. That's a majority. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> imagine, imagine having 13 of your friends all together and then you're ordering pizza and now try to get like just one topping. Okay. okay. Are you picturing the chaos? Is somebody shouting pepperoni? No, I don't eat meat. Like my brother's vegetarian. He does not eat meat at all. Somebody shouting olives over there and you're like, Shh, somebody wants onions and you're like putting tape over their mouth. Like it's just, it's a mess, right? Well, that's, that's how it was trying to pass a law under the Articles of Confederation. It's not going to happen. Okay. Cause you can't get nine people to agree on anything. That's, that's too much. It's a super majority. It's actually two thirds. Um, now, in order to change, to amend the Articles of Confederation, you would need an even more ridiculous amount. You would need a unanimous vote from all 13 states um, in order to change the, the governing document, to change the Articles of Confederation, to add an amendment to it. So that was never going to happen. So this is a very rigid, very weak um, uh, document that sets up our first government of the United States. And um, to kind of further understand why I call it so weak, this first government, um, take a look at this chart, okay? Look at, the, look at the weaknesses on the left side and then the outcomes that they have over here. Um, Congress had no power. So remember, there's, there's under the articles, our first government of the United States, there's no power to collect taxes. So that meant we're always short of money. That meant that the government doesn't have any revenue, any money to spend on any of the things that government, you know, today we think of government doing or any of the things even back then that they use government for. Um, talk about like defending your borders. We, we just, I just mentioned that we're going to talk about the War of 1812 when Britain comes back and tries to take us back over again. We fight against them. Uh, you have to have money to pay for soldiers. Well, Congress could not raise money. Every one of the 13 states at this point in time in the 1780s, because uh, the articles are actually going to finally be ratified in 1781 when Maryland, the last holdout state, finally concedes. Uh, they did this due to some Western land claims. Virginia finally gave up. So 1781 to 1789, officially, uh, America was governed under the Articles of Confederation. Okay, it's a trivia question for you. 
Um, but yeah, every state of the 13 had its own militia, had its own military. Um, there was no national military. Remember, um, the Continental Congress put together by Washington and supposedly funded by the Continental Congress, um, the Continental Army, sorry, uh, they, uh, they relied on basically the generosity and charity of the states. And most of the, uh, the, the groups, the regiments made up the Continental Army were, um, you know, the the Maryland Fifth, the the Massachusetts, whatever, you know, they they were these state militias that were coming. Uh, so that was a big mess. Uh, Congress had no power to regulate foreign trade. Uh, back to the the first reason that the uh, the Annapolis Convention in 1786, I believe, is going to meet, which precedes the con uh, the Constitutional Convention, was because of this reason. There was fighting breaking out among the states. Uh, over trade barriers, and um, basically uh, there was no national framework for tariffs or trade or anything like that. Congress had no power to enforce its laws. There's no executive branch. There's no president. There's no executive departments. There's no United States military, okay? Um, so not only do you not have the money to pay for military, you don't have anybody to lead or order the military. Because uh, there's no chief executive, no commander in chief. Uh, approval of nine states was necessary to enact laws. It made it extremely difficult to almost impossible to like basically come up with any laws. Uh, they can't pass anything when they need that kind of super majority. And then they're never going to be able to amend the articles because it needed all 13 states. So there was really no way to change the government. Uh, remember, amend means to change. Uh, the government had no executive branch. It also had no judicial branch. That's that last one down there. Uh, there was no Supreme Court, so there was no way to settle disputes among the states or, or big, important, prominent court cases. Um, there's also the problem with trade and stuff. Uh, it should also be worth mentioning every state kind of was in charge of its own currency. There's no national currency at this point under the Articles of Confederation. Uh, that will also be a big uh, problem that our country will have to grapple with after we get the Constitution, but that's another thing to consider. So it is extremely weak, this first governing document that we had. But please remember why we did it this way. We did not want to break away from Britain and then be super hypocritical and create a government that was just like the one we had left. So that's why our founding fathers, when they made the Articles of Confederation, our first government, they made it a very weak central governments giving all the power basically to the state governments. Uh, but there are some things that happen under the articles that are worth noting. It's not all completely bad. Um, we do win the Revolutionary War while technically under the Articles of Confederation, so good on that. Um, and then also, it does set up a way to admit new states to the Union. Um, this was done by uh, several ordinances, but finally, the big one is the uh, Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Um, from 1784, the framework set up by Thomas Jefferson, uh, this is going to deal with the Northwest Territory. And we get this from the Treaty of Paris. Uh, we, we beat the British, or at least they, they give up because they have bigger fish to fry, remember? They're fighting the French and everybody else. So uh, in the Treaty of Paris in 1783, uh, when, when that's signed and, you know, uh, John Adams was there uh, negotiating, uh, I think uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin was there and uh, John Jay, uh, the document that they get gives America all the lands uh, south of Canada and uh, basically east of the Mississippi River. So... Um, of that land, uh, everything that's east of the Mississippi, uh, south of Canada uh, and the Great Lakes, and north of the Ohio River, that is the Northwest Territory. Um, today, it's this area you can see on the map in blue, okay? Um, now, what the problem was is that many of our states on the East Coast, they wanted that land. They were like, mine. And remember, you know, since, since the, not even the end of the French and Indian War, we've had tons of settlers crossing those Appalachian Mountains, you know, getting, getting their settling on, planting their flags, stirring up trouble with Native Americans. Remember Pontiac's Rebellion. 
Um, and so there's already settlers out in this area um, and you have various land claims from many of our original 13 states. Pennsylvania had land claims, Virginia had land claims, New York had, excuse me, land claims. So the question is, you know, if you give the land claims to any one of the states, then you're starting a civil war, basically. The states are going to fight each other. You had to have a peaceful way to resolve this. And you also have to think to the future, once there's enough settlers out there, aren't they going to become like basically, uh, you know, colonial citizens of the new United States? Uh, where will be their rights? How will they be part of our country? Um, and so this is what the Northwest Ordinance is going to have to answer. And this is a law passed under the Articles of Confederation, like I said, um, and it addresses these issues, these concerns. Basically, it's going to divide up the land into uh, plots of 36. Uh, each, each plot, each square is a square mile. Um, and you could see the 36, uh, 36 plots that equals six miles by six miles by six miles. So that's 36. Um, and it's divided up to where um, basically each of these plots can be sold privately and that will create a, a city. And all of the places like in the, the uh, I guess that's TAN, um, once they're sold off to businesses or private uh, families for residences and homes, they'll pay taxes and the taxes will go to pay towards that 16th square, which would be money for like a school. Um, because this is Thomas Jefferson and he's a big, uh, you know, he's a big believer in education. Uh, you start to get eventually like the University of Ohio and stuff uh, through this way. So it's not only uh, laying out a grid work for how this new land, the Northwest Territory will be settled, but also looking to the future to make sure that it will have the proper foundation um, for the society we, we want that's well-educated. Um, and uh, finally, they, they lay out that of the Northwest Territory, um, it can have between, eventually, it will be able to have between three to five states. That was part of the Northwest Ordinance. And uh, in order to be admitted as a state, uh, the, they had to um, basically petition for admittance once they had reached a population of 60,000 or more settlers. So they reach that number and then they can apply for admission to become a state. They can draft a, a state constitution. Um, until that point, they are still considered a territory um, with uh, a governor that would be appointed by the Congress and, and whatnot. Um, so this, this lays out how we're gonna be adding future states um, in a peaceful way that won't cause wars. However, there is one you know, filter, monitor, dark foreshadowing coming on you. Uh, one thing that, that does uh, have some ominous portents to it, and that is that uh, basically there is this free state, slave state issue. When a new state gets admitted, is it going to be admitted where it keeps out slavery? That'd be a free state. Or when it becomes a new state, will it be allowing slavery in, in that state borders? Um, now, in the Northwest Territories, this was called the Ipswich Miracle. No one's exactly sure who threw this, this provision in, uh, but basically in the Northwest Ordinance, slavery was outlawed. Um, and eventually, three to five states were allowed. Uh, five states do get uh, partitioned out of the Northwest Territory, eventually Ohio being the first in 1803. Um, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, there's Chicago there, uh, Wisconsin, and um, parts of Minnesota were also part of this, this territory. Uh, but that is the Northwest uh, Territories, and slavery was not allowed in these states. However, in lands that will be south of the Ohio River right there, such as new states like Kentucky that were added in the 1790s, even earlier, slavery will be allowed it. Um, allowed. So keep in mind that's going to be a huge debate moving forward. When new states get added, will they be added as a free state where they don't allow slavery or will they be admitted as a slave state where they do allow slavery? All right, so that's the Articles of Confederation, America's first government. 
Um, now we were just talking about all the weaknesses that it had. And I know in our last units, we talked about the conclusion of the war. There's a lot of uh, Continental Army soldiers that have not been paid. They are due back pay, they're due a pension, um, you know, for their service, they're supposed to get, you know, their money for, for serving. Um, but the Constantinople Congress has no money. And by the way, the Congress under the Articles of Confederation, our official governing, you know, national body has no money because it has no way to tax the states. Um, you know, so it can be like, hey, states, will you please pay these nice soldiers who helped us gain our independence? And the states would be like, uh, no, we got bigger issues to worry with. And our story with Shay's Rebellion is going to be particularly on the state of, who's the state that always caused lots of trouble and stuff? You probably guessed it. Massachusetts. Good job. Um, yeah, so Western farmers in Massachusetts are going to be led by a former uh, Continental Army soldier named Daniel Shays. Now, Shays was not one to trifle with. He had been a super soldier of the American Revolution. He was uh, so good uh, that basically the Marquis de Lafayette is going to award him a sword, like a ceremonial French saber uh, for his battlefield heroics. So this guy's legit. He's a really good, really talented soldier, put it all out there on the line for this new country. And then he doesn't get his pension and he's not being paid like a lot of these other soldiers because the Continental Congress and the Articles Congress has no money to pay these soldiers. Uh, remember, Washington put the quash on the Newburgh conspiracy so they don't revolt and, you know, name Washington the, the dictator or something. He turns that down like the American Cincinnati that he is. But this guy, Daniel Shays and many others like him, these soldiers go home and they find that you know, they've basically lost their homes. They've lost their farms because all the while they were fighting, their government, their state government was taxing their lands. You see the irony there? Um, and they're, they're due back property tax pay that they can't afford. <clears throat> um, and many of them go to debtor's prison, which was a thing, remember? You, you can't pay your debts, you would go to jail. Um, there wasn't such a thing as like bankrupt, really. Um, so that's the predicament that Daniel Shays and many of his compatriots find themselves in. Um, now, he is going to basically be the ringleader of this rebellion, but there will be others like him as well that are fomenting over this issue. Um, other things at stake, you know, when they went uh, to trial um, for their debts, um, many of these farmers and former, um, you know, Continental Army soldiers they were not being heard very favorably by local uh, judges. So they don't feel like they're getting fair trials. Um, also, they're being told, you know, if they even have any money, it was the Massachusetts paper money that was being severely overprinted. Now, if you, you overprint money, do you know what the problem might be? You have too much of this paper money, it becomes what? worthless, right? It loses its value because there's so much of it. That's like hyperinflation. Uh, inflation is when, you know, prices rise over time. A good example of this is like Germany between World War I and World War II. They had under the Treaty of Versailles all this money that they owed the Allied powers, and they couldn't pay it back because all of their best land and resources were stripped from them, so they just started printing off that money. Um, and then pretty soon in like 1925, a German beer at a German pub was like 2 million Deutschmarks. So that's what happens. Um, so that's what Massachusetts is undergoing. And meanwhile, these debtors, um, they are owing money to like European banks and whatnot who are demanding species money. This kind of sounds familiar, right? Remember the Currency Act way back in 1760s? Uh, that's what's going on. So because these bankers... Um, are basically being forced to pay back the debts that the states owe in species money. That's hard money like gold and silver. They're going to demand from those poor farmers and these, these poor soldiers who never got their pay for you know fighting. Uh, they're going to demand, hey, you can't pay us in that paper money. It's no good. It's worthless, right? You got to pay us in gold and silver, which there's not really any of that there. So there's no way even for these guys to pay uh, their, their, their debts back. 
Um, so you could see that it was, it was a very untenable. It's just, there's no end situation here. These guys are in quite the predicament and that's why they rebel. And, and it's not like they didn't try to uh, have their grievances aired. They went through the proper channels. They actually, uh, they actually filed their grievances with the Massachusetts legislature, uh, the government of Massachusetts, uh, giving forth many of the same grievances, the same complaints that you can find in the Declaration of Independence that we labeled against the, the British Parliament. Um, so, I mean, this is incredibly hypocritical of our new government. Um, and Massachusetts doesn't, you know, have any way to address these guys' complaints, and so they take up arms. They start refusing to go to court, they start uh, burning down courthouses and threatening judges, um, and they start gathering weapons. Um, and they actually go after the Massachusetts Armory, where all of the major, you know, weapons were stored for the state of Massachusetts for its militia in Springfield. And um, that's when they are met with uh, this was, there's an interesting story, actually. Uh, remember John Hancock with, uh, you know, he's the, he's the first president of the First Continental Congress, very important founding father, uh, signed his name real big on the Declaration of Independence. Uh, John Hancock had been the governor of Massachusetts in the early 1780s. He stepped down in 1785, right before Shays' Rebellion in 1786. He said it was because of his ill health. Maybe it was because he was a kind of smart business dude and he read the writing on the wall and knew that things were about to get really bad. And for the most part, John Hancock had been very sympathetic to these farmers and former soldiers kind of allowing their debts to go, you know, unchallenged, like, hey, you owe some stuff, that's fine. This could also get us into a discussion of think about how these people paid and operated, like barter economy versus market economy. Remember, we've talked about for a long time, there's this big divide between people in the rural places on the western frontiers, like these farmers who are, who are rebelling, and those merchants on the east coast. They're operating under different economic systems, basically. A barter economy in your frontier is where hey, if you owe some money or whatever, you pay when you have the harvest and you borrow when you can't pay. You know, that's how you, you operate. Uh, if you're living in the market economy, you know, everything is pretty finite. You got to pay the species stuff, you owe banks. Uh, it's very different operating systems there. But anyway, John Hancock had resigned his governorship in 1785, leaving it to uh, James Bowden, um, who was not very sympathetic. And that's kind of also another thing that gets this going. Uh, but anyway, so they try to take the armory at Springfield, and uh, Bowdoin is going to have a private mercenary force, basically funded by the merchants in the East Coast, like in Boston and Charlestown and whatnot, uh, of over 4,000. They're going to have to meet these Shazites, or regulators, as they were called. Regulators also at the beginning of the American Revolution, those who were trying to regulate the system, uh, fight against the taxation. So uh, they're going to encounter these Shazites uh, regulators and uh, stop them. And um, once a cannon is fired into the Shazites and a few of them are killed, they realize, whoa, this, this could actually, you know, we don't want to die over this. And it kind of breaks up. I think about a dozen of the rebellion's leaders, including Daniel Shays, were eventually uh, arrested and uh, charged with treason and condemned to death by hanging. Uh, for their crimes in Shays' Rebellion, but um, only two were actually ever uh, hung. And Daniel Shays, um, he eventually gets pardoned and lives out the rest of his life in New York and dies in like 1825. Still very broke though. Things just never work out for him. Um, and that's, that's the rebellion. Now you might be thinking, well, why do I spend so much time talking about that? This has been like almost 20 minutes talking about like Shays' Rebellion. Why does it matter, right? Well, here's the deal. Why did Massachusetts, the state, have to hire a private mercenary force to put down a rebellion of their own people who were trying to air their grievances over the very same situation that the colonies had just had with Britain and why they just fought a war and gained their independence? It's ridiculous, right? Okay. And, in reason, and the answer is because the Articles of Confederation were very weak. 
they did not have a national military that could have put it into this rebellion. They did not have an executive authority, a commander in chief to lead a military in order to put down this rebellion. Um, it fell on the state of Massachusetts who didn't have its militia. They had to hire these people uh, and borrow more money in order to do this. Um, in fact, one of the people who'd been extremely callous and ignoring the hypocrisy of the situation in the Massachusetts legislature was none other than Samuel Adams, who totally ignored these Shazites and said that they were ridiculous. And Samuel Adams was the one that fomented the rebellion and kept it going in the 1760s. So anyway, yeah, hypocrisy was rampant and it illustrated very clearly the weaknesses under the Articles of Confederation. It terrified our founding fathers and it's gonna be a major reason why they meet together um, and eventually have the Constitutional Convention in 1787. And there was an earlier uh, meeting over mainly trade issues at Annapolis, Maryland, uh, but they meet again the next year, 1787 we'll get the Constitutional Convention. And um, I'll start talking about the Constitutional Convention in our next lecture, uh, so I don't wanna make this too long, but uh, just a, a few quick things. Remember why we're having it. Um, it's because we need to, these founding fathers, they agree due to the weaknesses illustrated by Shays' Rebellion, that we have no national military, no executive, if things go wrong, no way to protect ourselves and enforce our laws, no way to pass laws, no way to have like uh, our currency uh, dealt with for the nation, every state's doing their own thing, printing off their own money, all of these problems need to be addressed. We need to fix the articles and that's why they agreed to meet in uh, 1787 in Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention. And of course, what will happen is they are going to, instead of making a few fixes on the articles, they're going to completely throw the Articles of Confederation in the trash, and they're going to come up with an entirely new government, a new document that will be called the Constitution of the United States. And that is the government that we still have to this day. That is our government of the United States, the thing that creates our presidency, our Supreme Court, our Congress. Uh, and all the other stuff, and gives us our Bill of Rights, our 27 amendments uh, that, are, that are all part of the, the Constitution. So this is a really big deal. Um, and uh, they meet in Philadelphia, like I said, it had to be in secrecy um, because uh, they're supposed to be there to fix the articles, but they're actually creating a new government and they need to be able to talk freely now, it's not like there's, you know, Twitter back in the day or some other way for people to, you know, quickly get out the word, but they could have some reporter like at a window there at Independence Hall, like listening to what's being said. So when I say that the founding fathers had to meet in secrecy for this constitutional convention, they had to have the window shut. And they're meeting mostly from like May onward in that summer of 1787. It is hot and the windows are shut and there's no casual dress code. So these guys are in their powdered wigs, their pantoons, their pantaloons, you know, their heavy coats. Uh, they are sweating. It's nasty. Um, and Benjamin Franklin, he is in attendance offering a, a huge amount of legitimacy to these proceedings. He was very much in favor of a new form of government. Uh, there he is. He was sitting for most of it, and his his carriage ride there was rough. But remember, he's from Pennsylvania. Um, you know, he's back from all of his touring of Europe and all of his rounds of being minister in different countries of Europe. Uh, but he is like 81 and suffering from gout. He's not doing too well, but he is there, and he's important. Um, so he's the elder statesman. Uh, James Madison who will be a fervent disciple, a follower of Thomas Jefferson, um, will also, this is James Madison, go on to become our fourth president of the United States. He's this little short guy, just five foot two. Um, he weighed less than a hundred pounds. Like I could literally hold James Madison in my arms. He was so tiny. Um, he was also very sickly when he was uh, a child. Um, sickly throughout most of his life, uh, but very strong-willed. Um, nobody actually really gave him much credit. They didn't think he'd live very long. Um, and uh, he actually 
what did I just do? I don't know. Huh, okay, I think it's fine. I think it's fine, everything's fine. Maybe this? Okay, I don't know. Anyway, it won't go away. Go away, HP. Nobody likes you. Oh God, what did I just do? Okay, whatever. Anyway, um, yeah, James Madison, he is going to uh, basically be the secretary for the convention. He was so excited, like, he was the student that did all the readings before class he had even started before the semester even started he had already come up with the plan uh, but he was kind of shy so he's going to have some of the other virginia delegates that are there like read off his his plan but he'll be taking furious notes and most of what we know about what was discussed during the constitutional convention comes from james madison's notes so kind of for that reason and also because a lot of his plans you know nobody else came as prepared as he did um, so a lot of his plans form the basis for the framework that will make up our, our branches, especially the legislative branch. For these reasons, we call little James Madison, uh, future President Madison, uh, the father of the Constitution. Um, so that is James Madison. I'll, we'll talk a lot more about him later. And then, of course, very important to the Constitutional Convention is Mr. George Washington. And uh, between his retiring as the general of the Continental Army and uh, 1787, Washington had been back in Virginia in Mount Vernon, his plantation, overseeing his slaves, overseeing his, uh, he, he loved to raise a uh, member of foxhounds. He created the American foxhound breed, his dogs, uh, horseback riding, you know, he's, He's busy. Um, he's certainly uh, very, very, uh, you know, careful monitoring his plantation and working very hard. Um, but he was doing what he loved. Like he loved his plantation. He loved overseeing it. That was what he wanted to do. And like he loved being retired. Um, but then because of Shay's rebellion and uh, his his good friend and kind of his surrogate son, Alexander Hamilton, you know, basically telling Washington about this convention and, and kind of urging him to go, Washington will reluctantly go. And because of his stature, prominence, Washington will be named the president of the convention. Um, and of course, once the framework is laid out and they come up with an executive branch, he's the obvious choice for being our first president under this new government, the Constitution. But keep in mind, he was kind of done. He was very reluctant to go. He's very reluctant to become president. He just wanted to be retired. He just wanted to be done with it and relax. But he can't do that. We needed him. All right. Hopefully, it kept recording. I don't know what's happening with it. But thank you, guys. And we'll talk more about the Constitutional Convention and our government that is set up by it next time. Talk to you later. Bye.